I'll, I'll be talking very much from an operational point of view in terms of health service management uh, and what I thoughts I've had, I guess, on, on the back of David's study and what I think it might mean for hospitals as we go forward. Um, people will know that the government's 2020 vision for health in Scotland is, is this. So they want us all to be able to have longer, healthier lives at home or in a homely setting. And that we'll have a healthcare system that really, um, as, as Richard said, is integrated between health and social care. We'll have a big focus on prevention and self-management. And the hospital treatment, where it is needed, will be in a day case form, wherever possible. And that if, if people are admitted to hospital, they'll go back home or into their community as soon as they can with minimal risk of readmission. So in terms of thinking about what happens in the future, some of those people who have multiple admissions to hospital at the moment, some of those people in David's survey who came in and out of hospital in the last year of lives, they might not be in hospital in the next 2020. So we need to think about hospitals are evolving, as both Richard and David said. They're changing. They're going to continue to change. We need to think about hospitals will be what will they will be in the future, as, as well as what they are at the moment. But, as you know, um, well, I have to use the proper quote, I'll get it wrong, in this world nothing can be certain except death and taxes. And at this point I have to confess, um, Ewan Patterson changed my life. Um, sorry Ewan. Um, <laughs> I've been working with kind of palliative care colleagues for around seven or eight years. Um, and until then, I was probably a very typical member of, of the public. I hadn't thought about death or dying. I was mid-40s at that point. Um, hadn't thought about it. Hadn't really thought about my parents dying, if I'm honest. Kind of knew it would happen, clearly, but hadn't really thought about it. And only through working with palliative care have I come to terms with that fact that really I need to think about it. Uh, so I've now got a power of attorney. I've got an ECP. I've had those conversations with my parents, and I think they were a bit worried because I came very focused on it. So I think they thought I was up to something. But, but I have had that discussion with them. I've encouraged my two brothers and their families to have that discussion. So I've started to think about death and dying, but I'm probably quite atypical. And you're all probably quite atypical as well. A lot of you are interested. You, if you weren't interested, you wouldn't be here. You've probably thought about that for yourselves and your families. Uh, but most people in society haven't thought about that. And I know you all know that. So hospitals are a microcosm of society. Yes, the NHS in Scotland is a huge employer. We have interactions with hundreds of thousands of people every day. But most of the people that work within hospitals will have not particularly thought about death and dying. They might have thought about it in a work context. They haven't potentially thought about planning and thinking about that. And if they haven't thought about it for themselves and their loved ones, how do we expect them to then have a conversation with patients and their families in a similar way? So when we think about this, this question, acute hospitals reflect what happens in our society. So whatever we're thinking about, we need to, we need to address at a kind of public level, as well as that very micro um, environment of what happens when you're in a hospital. Particularly, as in future, hospital interactions will be shorter, sharper, and much more focused. So turning to, to the service that I'm responsible for, uh, this is what happened last Monday in the Queen Elizabeth University um, Hospital in Glasgow. We admitted 280 patients, mixture of planned admissions for, for elective procedures and emergency admissions, uh, an above average day for emergency admissions, as you might have read. Um, we discharged 217 patients from the Queen Elizabeth sector that, that day. Um, and of those 217 patients, seven died. Um, two in the critical care unit, uh, one in an older people's ward, one a general surgery ward, one a vascular ward, one in an acute receiving unit, so that person had been in hospital for less than 24 hours, and one in a cardiology ward. So not, I was trying to work out in my head how many kind of people would have been in hospital at any one time to try and work out the proportion, and I'm not very good at that. Um, so I think probably less that, than the figures that David was quoting earlier. So um, again, two years on from 2013, we've changed a lot of what we do in healthcare. Fewer and fewer people are coming into hospital. Um, work within health and social care partnerships, even before the, the, the formal integration, has kept a lot more people at home. So again, increasingly, less people are perhaps in our acute setting. Crucially, on average, people were only in hospital for four and a bit days during September. So all the thousands of people who were admitted to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in September, on average, they stayed four and a half days. So any interaction with the hospital staff is very short. 
not a lot of time to have a, an ongoing therapeutic relationship, not a lot of time to have potentially very difficult conversations. Some people will have stayed a lot longer um, and some people will have stayed an even shorter period of time. But on average, that's what people have stayed for and in future, it will be even less. So in terms of thinking about what this means for acute hospitals as we go forward, I just thought I would put it into two kind of thought patterns. Firstly, the big message of the study was, was how do we identify those people entering the last year of their life? Now again, not, been, not an expert, not a clinician, um, but been around enough discussions with palliative care over the years to know that there are lots of tools and scales and all kinds of things, and they've all got kind of acronyms, um, but there's not been one yet that I've discovered people universally agree with. Um, I've not had one yet that we've actually been able to implement reliably for every patient every time. Uh, so how do we do that? It might be easy to say we want to do it, but how do we do it? And I'm a pragmatist. I'm responsible for doing, making sure the how happens. So whatever we're going to do, it needs to be realistic. Um, do we use a surprise question? That was how we increasingly talked about, about delivering, that, having that conversation in hospital. But if you've only known somebody for a day and you're only going to know them for four days, how can you answer that question? Are acute hospitals the right place to start that discussion? And who does it? Um, is it the person who admits you? Is it the person who plans your discharge? Do you do it at the beginning of a journey into hospital when you've had an acute crisis? People haven't yet worked out what your care plan is. Do they do it when, when you're being discharged, when you're going back to your own home and community? But does that leave you um, with that question in your head without any support? We send you home having asked you to think about the fact that you might be in the last year of your life. Not sure about the burden that gives to somebody psychologically returning home. So. I think there's a big question about how, when and why and indeed if we should be doing this in acute hospitals and actually whether we should be doing this in other settings. There will be some patients who absolutely have an ongoing relationship with the clinical team that they're cared for they've been, or they've been given a malignancy diagnosis. Absolutely, you have to have that conversation at the time. The vast majority of people, those older people admitted as an emergency into a medical ward, I'm really not sure about and I'm sure that's what we'll talk about later. But Caring for people at the end of their lives? Absolutely. I think anybody who works in an acute hospital with, pro and it, I, think, I can't think of where, maybe obstetrics is a tiny part of their practice. Nobody who works in an acute hospital can't um, have looked after somebody at the end of their lives. But what characterises good palliative care is what characterises good care. So all of the work that we're doing nationally about providing individual person-centred care, that applies to palliative care as well. We should be treating every patient with all these things. So palliative care is one aspect of that. We should be identifying their individual needs, not calling them palliative, but they have palliative needs. We should be thinking about if they're deteriorating. We should be thinking about what the response to that deterioration is. For somebody at the end of their life, that will be a different response potentially from somebody not at the end of their lives. And crucially, that has to be communicated and agreed with the family and with the patient themselves. Now, this would apply to anybody's care. It should apply to anybody's care. So if we can deliver that for every patient, every time, the fact that we're identifying the palliative care need just means that that individual need is being met rather than a non-palliative care need. Turning to the role of the specialist, I know many of you here are from the specialist palliative care community. How can you support doing that? Um, it, it might be that the, there's levels of resources to be invested in specialist care, but here in the figures that David's talked about, knowing the number of people that are dying every year in Scotland, how can specialist palliative care deliver care to them they can't? How can you influence um, the generalists? And which, where do you sit in terms of that pyramid? The specialist palliative care and the expert generalist people who deliver palliative care are probably in the middle and the bottom of the pyramid, and the very specialist is right at the top. It's a very small resource. You all know that. How can we make best use of that? What is the best role of any specialist? In reality, it's about providing advice on specialist treatment, pain control, symptom control, psychological support. Crucially, I think it's about involving and providing support for staff, either having that and then having that difficult conversation or after they've had a difficult conversation. Not something they might do every day. Psychological support, really important. And how do you do it? 
Um, again, we've tried lots of things over the years to try and support people to gain specialist skills, whether that's in palliative care or tissue viability or dementia. We want generalists to have a little bit of specialists in everything. That's very difficult for them. This is a tiny part of what they do, but it's a crucial part of what they do. So again, delivering and supporting people in the clinical environment they work in, in their clinical teams, using real patients, real cases to do reflective practice, to me seems something that we can actually deliver. It means that all the things we're trying to do are an integral part of care of every patient every time, and I genuinely believe that will be the only way that we'll be able to change. Having things as an add-on or another special thing to do is extraordinarily difficult for us to deliver, and I think increasingly we've known through our quality improvement work that that's not the way you get change. You get change by embedding things into every day and making it a part of normal practice. And finally, I just wanted to end with a patient story. Um, you probably, you, you can, I don't think you can have avoided any of the media about the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in, in the last week or so. Um, and I thought I would end just with a patient story of end of life care in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital just to show that it can be done and it is being done every day. And whenever we talk later on about what the reality of that, we should remember that people do deliver excellent end of life care every day in our acute hospitals in Scotland. Thank you. <laughs>